So this talk is about software architecture. Boo. And it's also about code. This talk is based upon uh, a chapter I wrote in uh, Uncle Bob's Clean Architecture book. The chapter is called The Missing Chapter. Last time I checked, it's still there. <laughs> Grab it while it's still there. So architecture, what is architecture all about? If we look at the Grady Boots definition of architecture, it says that architecture is about the significant decisions, where significance is measured by cost of change. So significant decisions on our software projects, our software products includes key technology choices. So if you're building a Java app today, you can't refactor it to be a Ruby app tomorrow. Significant choice. Uh, key frameworks, technologies, APIs that become embedded in our systems, in our code bases, and also structure, monoliths, microservices, and so on and so forth. Let me try something. Imagine we are building the most boring web application in the world, just shows data to, to users, and that data comes from a relational database. Forget NoSQL and document stores and all that stuff. And let's say this thing has no complicated requirements around performance security scaling. How do we write it so that we could potentially make our choice of database be not significant later? What techniques would we use? Abstraction, and specifically things like an ORM, Hibernate Entity Framework. So what we do when we're writing our web application, we drop some code in there somewhere, that becomes our data access point, and we access our database through that thing. So by using this technique, we can make the choice of database potentially be not significant. Now there are some caveats here, of course, but this is a good thing. We've moved the significant decision. How do we change the ORM if we want to later? Go on, say it. We encapsulate it. So we add another abstraction on top of the existing ORM abstraction, right? Anybody do this? Really? <laughs> so we wrap up the abstraction. So now we can change the database and we can potentially change the ORM if a bunch of things line up. So by using different design approaches, we can make significant decisions in different places in our architecture. The significant decision we make in terms of layering is one of structure rather than technology choices. So this is all about very subtle trade-offs. So the model code gap, there's a great book on architecture by George Fairbanks. The model code gap is basically, imagine we are having an architecture discussion or we're drawing some diagrams on a whiteboard. We are going to be using terminology like component, service, module, layer, subsystem, etc. These are abstractions we use to describe architecture. Show of hands, who's a Java developer here? It's a good chunk of you, right. In Java, is there a layer keyword? No, not the last time I checked as well. Same with C Sharp and other languages. So how is it that we are building layered architectures in Java, but there's no layer keyword? And the answer is we are taking interfaces, classes, packages, namespaces, folder structures, and we are combining them into something we conceptually call a layer. If this mapping does not make sense, or if it's not very clear how your code represents a layer, when you draw a layer on your architecture diagram, that's the model code gap. It's that difference in implementation style. The other way to think about this is, if I ask you to draw me a picture of your architecture now, you'll draw me a nice high-level picture. If I find some tooling to reverse engineer a diagram from your actual code base, I won't get the same picture you drew me. Because we have a very different way of thinking of our, of our code bases, of our software systems. Again, this is the model code gap. Back in the mid to late 90s, Philip Christian said to describe a software architecture, we use a model composed of multiple views or perspectives. This is his four plus one approach to describing software architecture. This is what it looks like. It has a logical view and a development view and so on and so forth. He fast forward a number of years, Owen Woods and Nick Rosansky, they have a book like this. They create something called viewpoints and perspectives. They take four plus one, they extend it. Every architecture book you read will do the same thing. Every software architecture document template will do the same thing. We have a very set um, number of ways to describe architecture. The thing that bugs me about lots of this stuff is that you often see this separation between the development view of the world and the logical view of the world. And this bugs me because ultimately what we get to is a set of diagrams that never match our code. And I see this a lot. I see these organizations with these grand looking architecture diagrams and then you ask the, the development team, so are these useful? And the developers go, no, because they don't match the code. Right. So I want to give you a very simple example of what I'm talking about with the model code gap. So I have a, a 
uh, a diagramming technique called C4, which you can find at c4model.com. It stands for Context, Containers, Components, and Code. So uh, we, have, we have a very top-level diagram which shows the system context. You then kind of zoom into that thing to show what I call containers, basically applications and data stores. You then zoom into an individual container to show components inside it. So hopefully at this point, the component diagram starts to reflect things in your actual code base. So you'll see there's a tweet component in the top right corner. So we zoom into that thing and, oh, something happened. So on the previous picture, there was a tweet component box. It was one box, one thing. And the code looks like this. So this is a real example of a real code base I once worked upon. And the question to ask is, well, where is the component? Because the component doesn't actually exist as a single thing in the code base. The component conceptually exists as a collection of interfaces, classes, and packages. This is essentially the model code gap thing again. And it's fine to say this, and I'm sure we say this all the time, yeah, we talk about layers and components and they exist conceptually, but the code doesn't really look like that. That's fine, we all understand that. But I think we need to get better at doing this and stop using this as an excuse. So in this book by George Fairbanks, he talks about a solution to this problem. And it's basically about adopting an architecturally evident coding style. Now this sounds very grand and very complicated, but it's nothing more than basically making your code structure match your architectural ideas and intent. That's it. So if you now fall asleep for the, re the remainder of this talk, that's all you need to know. I'm gonna talk about a few other things as well. So, Let's bring this back to code. How do we normally structure our applications? So there are a bunch of ways we can do this. So I'm, I'm gonna pick a very simple example and we'll run through a, different, uh, a number of different scenarios. So the first code structure I'm gonna talk about very quickly is package by layer. Now hopefully we all understand this so we don't need to go, go into too much detail. But basically what you're doing here is you're organizing your code from a technical perspective. So you're sticking all of your data access together and all of your business -y stuff together and so on and so forth. It's a, it's a horizontal slicing. It kind of looks like this. So imagine we have some web application that deals with orders and order functionality. We have a web layer with maybe web controllers in there. We have some sort of business -y service thing in the middle, and then we might have some data stuff at the bottom. And I can see people going, oh, this is horrible, we don't do this. Good. There are different types of layered architectures. You've got relaxed versus strict layered architectures. Basically, it's, you know, what are the rules around calling lower layers? Are we allowed to skip round, or must we go through the next closest layer, and so on and so forth? Why do we still, or why have we done these sorts of um, approaches to structure our code? Because everybody tells us to. So every time you read a book, it says, uh, you should structure your code like this. Um, every sample project you see on the web, demos at conferences are notorious for doing this. It's just a nice, easy way to get started. You know, if you have a small code base, you can lay your things, and it's nice and easy. It's a nice, easy code organization structure. There's something called cargo culting as well, which some of you might be familiar with. It's basically doing stuff, and you don't really know why, but you think you should. And I see this applied to the way we structure code quite a lot. Now, hopefully, Bob is sitting in the back of the room and he's going, this is horrible, Simon, stop talking, and I completely agree. So, a while back, Bob wrote this great blog post called Screaming Architecture, and he basically said, if you look at most code bases, they all look the same. It's all web stuff and business stuff and data stuff, yay. And that's not how we do, like, blueprints for buildings. You know, if you look at a house, it says this is a house. Martin Fowler said the same thing a while back. So, he said that the, you know, the layered approach to structuring code is a good, simple way to get started. However, once you st start to get more code, more complexity, you have to start modularizing inside your layers. So maybe slicing horizontally is not the best approach for large code bases, so maybe you need some additional vertical slicing as well. The other thing to bear in mind is even if you have a layered architecture, so say we have um, a web page to that allows you to do something with orders, 
if you want to add a field to an order, you have to change the web page stuff, the server stuff, the data stuff. So typically, lots of changes that we make to our software impact all layers as well. So layered architectures have a number of downsides, which brings me on to package by feature. This is probably what I see a lot of people doing these days. And what we're trying to do here is we're trying to organize code by feature or functional grouping. So it's a kind of vertical slicing instead. How do you organize your code? It's up to you. There's lots of ways to do this. You can all get right around, um, you can organize it around feature groups or domain concepts or you know, DDD aggregate roots and so on and so forth. And it's a vertical slicing. It's a kind of top to bottom slicing. So we might have all of our orders related code in an orders package in Java, for example. This is a different way to structure code. It's not necessarily a better way to structure code because it still has some interesting trade-offs. If you have orders and customers in unique slices and you want to talk between the slices, you now have to make some decisions. People say that package by feature gives you better cohesion because you're sticking all of your, in this case, order stuff in a single place. And it's also easier to find code. I don't buy this argument anymore because most people are hopefully using IDEs and you can find code in IDEs really easily. Now, there are lots of people sitting here probably going, yeah, we don't do this either because we do ports and adapters instead. Who's doing ports and adapters? Wow. I'm very surprised. So ports and adapters is basically what you're trying to do here is you're trying to keep your businessy domainy stuff separate from your technical stuff. There are lots of variations on this theme. Hexagonal architectures, clean architectures, onion architectures, and so on and so forth. And basically, if you were to kind of draw a picture of these uh, architecture approaches, there's an inside thing, and the inside is basically your technology agnostic domain specific part of your code base. And there's an outside thing, which is all about your technology choices. And from a dependency perspective, the outside depends upon the inside. So this is one of the cardinal rules about ports, adapters, style approaches. So what does this look like? Something like this, maybe. So maybe we have a bunch of domain stuff sitting inside. No technology choices in here. And all of the outside stuff is the stuff that talks about databases and web app frameworks and so on and so forth. How might we code this up? There are lots of ways you can do this, but maybe something like I've shown you on the right-hand side here. So we might have a package for our web stuff. We might have a package for our data stuff, and all of the technology agnostic stuff kind of sit in the middle. Arrows going both ways, dependency relationships. This is also a different approach. It's not necessarily better, it has trade-offs. And this is an approach I also see lots of people cargo culting, unfortunately. Especially, and don't get upset with me, in the DDD community. One of the big problems with the ports and adapters architecture is that not all technology choices, not all frameworks are equal. If you look at most boring web applications, right, you might have like 50 pages of, 50 web pages doing stuff, presenting information to users, and maybe that's all getting data from one database, maybe you know, 10 tables in that database. The surface area is very, very different. So you've got lots of stuff at the top, at the top, um, a minimum amount of surface area at the bottom. So therefore, it's much easier to you know, make the bottom part of your architecture technology agnostic than the top half. So again, there are trade-offs here. But, This talk is also about rotting code. I like that analogy with meat, because that's exactly what happens when you don't look after your code bases. So imagine we have our boring, traditional layered architecture, and somebody new joins your team, and you want to get them productive quickly, you want to give them nice, simple tasks to do, so you say, hey, welcome to our team. We need to add this new feature to our web app relating to orders. Can you go away and do it for me, please? So they have a look through your code base. They do some exploring. And of course, there are no architecture diagrams, so they can't use that as a reference. And eventually, they come back a couple of hours, and they say, yes, it's done. 
And what they've done is, they, you know, imagine you've got a web page and you just want to get more data on the web page, and they've seen there's some sort of repository for order information. Bingo, we'll just use that. And they bypass your nice, strict, layered architecture. And everybody te on the team does this at some point, and if left unchecked, you start to get a mess. Has anybody seen this happen for real? I think it's a few more people than that. Come on. <laughs> this is one of those things, and although we start out with nice intent, if left unchecked, we can get into what's typically referred to as a big ball of mud. It's a haphazardly approach, uh, haphazardly, a haphazard approach to structuring the system. And again, it's the same thing Bob talked about, you know, oh, we have a deadline. Well, let's just kind of hack some code in quick. Let's make this the simplest thing that could possibly work. Forget any architectural principles. Architectural principles. So that's what people do, don't they? You know, you have your team boundary, and you say, right, we're going to have a strict layered architecture. Anybody writing code up here must go through this set of layers to get to the database. So often, we'll see teams create architectural principles. They write these on their, on their whiteboard somewhere, or they stick them in Confluence. And these principles provide, hopefully, a way for teams to build code in a consistent manner. It's about boundaries and guidelines for consistency's sake. And the principles go something like this. You know, web controllers should never access repositories directly. And that's fine. But how do you enforce this stuff? And a lot of people say, well, we trust our developers, so everything's good. Yeah, about that. The problem with trusting developers is that there's a lot of other factors here. Budgets, time scales, things we're worrying about at work, maybe. We're all still human. And if there's a shortcut to be taken, it's pretty tempting to take that shortcut. And this is what Bob was talking about before, of course. So how else can we solve this problem? Well, it's 2018, right? And we have computers. And computers can do stuff. So why don't we make the computers verify the architecture? So why don't we use computers to help us build good code, well-structured code? So there's a great book, Building Evolutionary Architectures. And they talk about something called fitness functions. And there are a whole bunch of fitness functions. Some are related to um, asserting performance or scaling or security characteristics of software. Others are around structure. So for example, verifying things like psychic, psychic complexity or coupling between things in your code base. And there are lots of tooling options you have to do this if you don't want to rely on just trusting your developers. A whole bunch of static analysis tools out there. Uh, Structure 101, Endepend, Latix, you know, the kind of GUI versions. You've got JDepend, Endepend, JQ Assistant, Arc Units. You've got a whole bunch of tooling out there that can help you do this stuff. And with these types of toolings, what you normally do is you integrate them into your build process, hopefully. So when you do something wrong, your build breaks. And you're writing rules that basically reflect your architectural principles. So you'll, you'll write rules that say, you know, types in package star star slash web should not access directly star star data. Anybody using these sorts of tools? Yeah. These are not very common because they're kind of time consuming to set up. They'll break pretty quickly on most code bases, to be fair. And we've got better things to do. I'm not necessarily recommending this as a good solution to a lot of these problems because it seems like a hack. So writing code to assert code structure for me seems like a hack. And it's really trying to work around the shortcomings in the languages that we are using today. So we have a bunch of ways I think that are potentially better to fix this. Number one is to use model-driven engineering I'm actually not going to suggest that as an approach, right? <laughs> because of a bunch of reasons I'm not going to go into after we have lunch. Number two, we create better languages. So if we do want to build layered architectures, let's have languages with layer as a keyword. So we can have 
true architectural constructs and abstractions in our programming languages. That's a bit more of a, a kind of stretch goal. Option three, why don't we just use the languages we've got properly? So in Java, we have packages. And there's, a, there's an access modifier which allows you to hide code. It's, it's package protection. It's, it's actually the default modifier. In C Sharp, you've got you know, assemblies and internal scopes. So why don't we use this as a way to encapsulate code? And it's at this point people say, well, yeah, Java's flawed, blah, blah, blah. And they're right, you know, Java's not perfect. So there's no sub-package um, kind of access modifier stuff in Java. But given where we are today, and that, yeah, Java might be flawed, for example, why don't we still try? And so I'm going to present you another approach, uh, which I call package by component. And this is typically how I try to build my own software. So I'm kind of using these techniques in the real world. And what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to organize code by bundling stuff together that really belongs together. So I'm trying to figure out you know, what demarcates a component in my code base, and let's stick all of that stuff together in one place. So what do I mean by component? I mean a grouping of stuff with a hopefully nice, clean, simple interface around it. And this version, this definition of component comes from my C4 model, or more specifically, the set of abstractions that underlie my C4 diagrams. So when I'm thinking about a software system, a software system is made up of a number of containers, web apps and data stores, not Docker, sorry. Containers contain components, components are built from code. That's essentially the set of hierarchical abstractions that I use to think about and describe my software. So from an implementation perspective, what I'll do is something like this. So I'm, something I like to do, and this is just my personal preference, is I like to keep any of my UI stuff totally separate. So I'm going to create basically an orders component with all of the business logic and all of the data logic in. And that's one thing. That's an orders component. And I want to keep my UI separate, my web app stuff separate in this case. Because I think that the orders thing, being a non-visual component, can be reused from other web pages, API, endpoints, and that sort of thing. So again, that's just personal preference. What I'm ultimately trying to do here is I'm trying to apply old-fashioned, component-based, and service-oriented thinking, specifically in this case, to a monolithic deployment unit, a monolithic application. And one of the core things I'm trying to do here is use modularity as a guiding principle for when I'm structuring my code base. It's funny. If you look at how people build monoliths, typically, they do layered architectures or ports adapters or you know, whatever they, they use. If you look at how people build microservice architectures, they're totally different. So if you have a microservice, it has a public API and a whole bunch of code in, internally that you can't see inside of. So if you have a microservice and a database, if you want access to stuff in this database, you don't go talk to the database directly, normally. You go through the public API, which is remotable. It's you know, a separate, isolated process. What I'm trying to do here is apply that same thinking to a monolith. So I'm going to have a bunch of stuff with the implementation details inside and a public interface. So with my orders thing, if you want access to the orders from the orders database, you can't get access to this thing here. It's package protected, hopefully, in Java. You have to go through the public API. So this is all good, right? We have a bunch of different architectural styles, a bunch of different ways we can organize our code. All right. The devil here is in the implementation details. And if there's one thing we should try and remove from Java, it's that damn public keyword. <laughs> because every time, this is muscle memory, every time I personally write a new Java class, I always type public by default, and I don't know why, and it drives me nuts. If you use wizards and stuff, they also give you public classes by default, and it's just crazy. The number of times I've gone through my code to like refactor it, and I've noticed a public, I'm like, this should not be public, delete it. And hopefully the tests still work. We need to remove public stuff in our code bases. Because there's a big difference between how we organize our code and how we encapsulate our code. This is a very subtle thing, 
that I want to talk about. And I'm going to use the four, uh, the four architectural styles, the four code structures, as a way to describe what I'm talking about. And this is a Java-based example, but you can apply these things to other languages. So if you forget about, say, Java's access modifiers, and you just default to using the public keyword everywhere, the four architectural styles and approaches I just showed you, although they are conceptually different, so horizontal slicing, vertical slicing, ports and adapters, package by components, although these are very conceptually different things, if, you, if you're not careful with the use of the public keyword, they're all syntactically identical. Now I can see some people thinking, really? So let me show this to you. Here's some UML. Who'd have thought that? So here are the four examples side by side. So we have layered architectures, packaged by feature, ports and adapters, packaged by component. If we make all of these classes and interfaces public, these types are accessible from anywhere in your code base, in the JVM in this case. And although we've got packages on this picture, the packages are meaningless. The packages are simply used as folder structures to organize code. There's no encapsulation here. So essentially what we can do, so if we're not using packages for encapsulation, let's forget packages, let's remove them from the equation. Now look at the diagram. All four options are identical. That's a neat trick, huh? You have to, you know, line up the elements, but all of the arrows are exactly the same. And this is what happens whenever I see uh, organizations and teams and they say, we have built a ports and adapter style code base, and I look at the code base, I'm like, this is just a layered code base. You've, although you think you're building ports adapters, you're just doing a boring, old-fashioned layered architecture. And it's because they're using the public keyword everywhere. So access modifiers in Java, right? Java's not perfect. But what about we start trying to use the access modifiers and to make some of these types more restrictive when they can be made more restrictive? So here's the same diagram again, with the packages back on. And what I've done now is I've grayed out all of the types that can potentially be made package protected. So you, you kind of have to work these through in your head. So let's say for the sake of argument, all these front end controllers are public. That's not necessarily true, but let's just say that for the sake of argument. In order for this thing to talk to the order service in a different package, this interface needs to be public. But the implementation class can be package protected. This raises the question, how do you instantiate this thing? This is where DI containers like Spring come into play because Spring will let you instantiate package protected things. Same thing applies. If this orders service impl, which is a horrible name, wants to rely on this orders repository, the orders repository interface needs to be public. Ditto with the implementation class. It can be package protected. In the package by feature approach, all we need is that single public entry point this is our web stuff, and then everything else can be package protected. Provided nothing else needs to talk to anything in that package. For ports and adapters, it's the same thing, so that interface needs to be public, so this will be on the inside. Similarly, the orders interface needs to be public. That can be package protected, depending on a public interface, likewise, that thing can be package protected as well, the inflation class. Do you notice the similarity between the layered architecture and the ports and adapters even with package protection on? They're very similar. Uh, package by component, I'm gonna treat the orders controller as a separate component. I'm gonna have a single orders component interface, public interface, and all of this stuff I don't care about, it's an implementation detail. It's package protected. So what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to use encapsulation, proper encapsulation, in this case using Java's packaging mechanism, to minimize the potential number of dependencies I have on my code inside that package. The other way to look about this is it's really about surface area. So the surface area of your internal APIs, 
to go back to the model code gap should match your architectural intent. So if you want to build a layered architecture, you should have a bunch of things representing layers in your code base. If you want to build uh, a monolithic application that's a bunch of components, you should have a bunch of components with nice, clean, simple interfaces. So we're trying to get that parity between the way we think about our architecture and the code structure itself. So what I would urge you to do here is to, you know, if you are building monolithic applications using a single code base, try to use a compiler more. You know, if you have a bunch of code and it's package protected, you can't access it. You can cheat, please don't do that. You can add the public keyword, don't do that either. But you know, we can start using the compiler to say, hang on a second, we have this structure and you're trying to do something that's not allowed by this structure. So I, I'd encourage you to use the compiler rather than adding additional tooling to create fitness functions to a certain structure. Because as I said before, that seems like a hack. There are some other decoupling modes you can use. So this is something that Bob talks about in his clean architecture book, decoupling modes. Ways to break up your code base. Java has a module framework now. And with things like module frameworks, you can differentiate public types from published types. So you can create a Java module, and all of your code can be public, but you can only export and, and therefore publish specific parts of that module. So again, you're creating a nice, small surface area, nice, simple public API, and hopefully some nice, clean stuff inside, but it doesn't matter because you know, people can't see inside it. Alternatively, you can split your source tree into multiple parts. So rather than have one single monolithic code base, you can split it up into multiple Maven modules, Gradle modules, and so on and so forth, uh, Visual Studio projects, and so on. This is particularly of interest if you are doing the kind of ports and adapters, hexagonal style approach. Because what I normally see in these approaches is either everybody puts their code in one code base, which has issues, or more commonly, you see two code bases for ports and adapters style architectures. You have one code base for the inside stuff and a single code base for all of the outside stuff. And this is kind of nice because if you do have separate code bases at compile time, stuff in the inside cannot see stuff on the outside, if you compile them in the right order, of course. The problem with only having two separate code bases for ports and, adapt, uh, ports and adapter style architecture is that it's very possible to cheat. So if you, if you have all of your infrastructure code in this outside layer, stuff here can call stuff here directly in many cases. So this is why, I, again, I would encourage if you are doing ports and adapters, you break it up into lots of small code bases, one per you know, path to the outside world, essentially. That's all good in theory, but there are many trade-offs of doing this. So once you do have lots of source trees, you start to run into other issues like increased build times, increased complexity, Visual Studio not loading, and, and so on and so forth. More generally, all of the different types of decoupling modes have different trade-offs. And this is the whole monolith versus microservices thing again, isn't it? So the ultimate way to decouple code is to stick a network around it separate process spaces. This is essentially what microservices does. But that comes with a whole lot of baggage. It's more complicated, more moving parts in the architecture. You have to get good at automated provisioning and deployment and uh, tracing and log aggregation and all of that other stuff. So there are always trade-offs here. So kind of in closing, um, whatever architectural approach you choose, make sure you don't forget about the implementation details. So make sure your code structure really reflects your architectural ideas and intent. I'm gonna throw this out there and then kind of run away from it, but I think we should also think about creating a much stronger link between the way we think about our architecture, the way we structure our code, and the way we test all of that stuff. These things should match, but they don't. And the reason they don't, and I'm not gonna talk about this funny thing here that looks like a testing pyramid, but it's not a testing pyramid. Talk to me afterwards. One of the things I see many teams do is they trade off testability for granularity. So to give you a good example, I've seen lots of code bases that are literally thousands of really tiny things which are super testable on their own, but the system is just a nightmare to understand because it's all these things collaborating at runtime with dependency injection and you don't really know what's going on. 
And I think techniques like dependency injection and unit testing, especially at the very kind of low level, have potentially kind of forced people down a route where they're breaking their code base up into really lots and lots of small moving parts. And they've lost some sense of the coarse, grain, um, coarse granularity of that code base. And again, this contributes to the model code gap thing. You think about your system as a bunch of big, coarse grain components, but when you look at the code, it's totally different. So again, I'm going to throw it out there and kind of run away. So it is in summary, summary, you know, do consider the model code gap. Why? Because it tends to result in systems that are easier to talk about. So you have a bunch of diagrams. The diagrams match the code. It's easier to onboard new staff. This is what our system looks like. Yay! Look, this is what the code looks like as well. It's easier to do architecture refactoring. It's easier to maintain code and so on and so forth. A good architecture gives you agility. A good architecture, a well-structured, highly modular code base, gives you the ability to move fast. And again, think about the model code gap can really help here. So that is that. Thank you very much. So we do have some time for some questions. If anyone would like a free copy of my book, you can go to these super secret URLs at the bottom here. Hi, Simon. Hello. Um, picking up from your last point, um, how do you, like, in any feature more or less complex, you will have to deal with some sort of data flow, which will involve possibly, well, depending how finely grained you design your components, it will involve uh, some sort of orchestration between those components. So what, what do you put that? Do you put that in another component? Or, you know, do you create different layers of components that deal with that? And a related question is, how do you, be, I mean, thinking that we are in the same code base, what do you define in the public API of a component? That is, what do you export as a data? Uh, because if you define models, then you couple any component to classes that were defined in another component anyway. Or, you know, and like you can translate that to the endpoint. Do you, do you use REST or GraphQL? And so do I export like raw data, like XML, JSON thing in my public API, or do I export data models? Or do I create data models for all the different domains that I need to talk to? And where is the mapping between domains? Sorry, it's a lot of questions. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> the, the simple answer is, it's kind of up to you, right? So there are lots of different design decisions you can make. So when I'm building components, um, I will normally have my components only kind of produce quite nice data structures, like Podrose, for example. And then if I want to map that to JSON, um, whatever, then I'll have some other set of components that, that do that transformation. In terms of, you know, where do you put your domain objects, your data structures? Do you put them inside the component or outside? Again, it's one of those things you have to tr uh, you, you kind of have to try because sometimes it works better when your data structures sit next to and kind of inside and, and a part of your component interface. And other times, you might want to have a, a kind of whole bag of domain stuff, which is your domain model, and then all of, all of your components relate to that stuff. And what's interesting, of course, is what I just described is very similar to ports and adapters, in a way, except maybe some of the business rules don't sit in the domain model, they sit a little bit further out from the center than you might normally expect. So there are lots of different ways to do this, and there's no single right answer. So sometimes I've put a uh, domain object in the components, and sometimes you get some really funny, interesting um, relationships and dependencies to that component. So sometimes you, you want to break them out. It's one of those things you have to try. You refactor, you write some tests, you move things around, you clean it up. That's the only answer I can give you, sorry. <laughs> This question at the front here. See, we're making you work now. I like this. <laughs> so what's your preferred way to protect against the raw reappearing, uh, the model code gap reappearing? So when you design the system, you might as well kind of try to minimize it, but then obviously with time, people will just modify public, private to public and get a new link. So what's your way to dealing with that? So what's my, what's my preferred approach to ensure that the model code gap doesn't come back or doesn't expand? The answer is every team needs technical leadership. How you do that technical leadership is entirely up to you. So in some teams, you have the technical leadership role 
distributed amongst everybody. That sometimes works. It sometimes doesn't work. More often than not, you have a dedicated person doing technical leadership. I have a, a term for this person, it's called the software architect. So I, again, a lot of this stuff is not new, but we seem to have forgotten as an industry how to apply technical leadership and sometimes discipline to the way that we work. So some of these problems can be solved with tooling, and other times you do need discipline. But I think there's a combination of both here that can work, rather than just relying on trust. Others will disagree, and that's fine. There this question also. Say any other questions right about here? <laughs> Hi, uh, that was great. Um, I'm slightly concerned that, um, well, I'll start. In 1949, Gilbert Ryle wrote an essay called The Theory of the Mind, uh, where he gave the example of, well, his example of a category error, which is sorry, basically, I, I, sorry, I, you can't, can't hear this, cool. Category error, so um, you're shown around a university, yeah? You arrive there and you're shown your refectory, you're shown the halls of residence, you're shown each department. And at the end of it, the intrigued visitor from uh, abroad says, thank you for showing me these things, where is the university? And obviously there is no university, uh, but there is just a series of components making up the university. So for Gilbert Ryle, this is a category error. So my question would be, when we are trying to push um, the idea of a component or a layer down into the code, as you've suggested we could do, is this just doomed to failure? <laughs> Is it possible to use architectural terms at the layer of software development? Not just use the terms, but actually use them as keywords, as things that make the code happen. Is that a concern you have when you've suggested this great idea? And if it's not a concern, then why isn't it already happening? <laughs> so it, it, it's a good question. Why don't we have languages that reflect component module service and so on? So, Is it you impossible? Know, you know, it, it would be nice to, 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 to have uh, Java say, you know, public microservice X. Mm. We can kind of do that with some of the frameworks. So if you look at Spring Boot and Micronaut and so on and so forth, you add like a special annotation and magic happens. But maybe that should be baked into language a bit more. I guess there are a bunch of issues here. Number one, we don't agree upon terms. Mm. So, you know, me throwing out the term component, everyone has their own different uh, definition of component. That's why I have my, my hierarchy of software system containers components. Other concerns I have, it will be abused. You know, let's create a layer, it's not really a layer layer, it's just something else. Same thing we've seen with you know, the LLs, essentially, bases and packages and folder structures. Um, I'm not sure. All of these things are open to abuse. I just wonder whether we're just making, you know, an, an extra layer called component, which is just going to have the same problems as package, the same yeah. problems as class, yeah. and everything no, else. I, I totally get that. I think what a lot of teams are missing is that holistic top-down view of their code bases. So one of the things I teach people is, is how to kind of step out of the code and to, to get that top-down view. And once you have that top-down view, and, and to give you a really simple example, I often work with teams, I say, draw me a, a picture of your architecture, and they draw me a bunch of layers with the arrows going down, everything looks lovely. And then you look at the code base, and it's a total mess, you've got arrows going back up. Once you get teams to acknowledge what their real structure looks like, that gives them the incentive to then go and fix it. And it's sometimes just visualizing and seeing these problems that I think leads us to a better path a lot of the times. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> We've got time for one more quick question. If there There's was one more. over on the side. There you go. What I might do is ask if we can pass the microphone down. Was it this gentleman at the end here? Hey, uh, thanks for your talk. My question, somewhat specific. You mentioned uh, using access modifiers to, you know, do all the things that you talked about, I suppose. Um, and I'm not terribly familiar with Java, so maybe this is a non-question. But if you make your implementations of your interfaces private, how do you test those implementations? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. How do you test all of the package protector stuff? So. In Java, you can have a, a package hierarchy that mirrors your production code, and you can see inside it. So that's, in Java, that's easy. In C Sharp, you've got friend assemblies, so you can grant access to your internals to friend assemblies. So there are ways to do it. I'm not sure if that applies for every language, but again, there are certain ways to do it. And again, it's trade-offs. It's do we go for modularity first, or do we go for testability first? <laughs> 
Okay, thank you very much, Simon. Thank you.